Howdy y'all, welcome to Cowboy Convos. Today, we're going to go over a recent bill passed in New York City concerning discrimination laws. I'm going to present the information just as is, then at the very end, I'll state my own opinion on the whole thing. I'll be referencing legal documents, some news reports, and a couple of relevant TikToks. All the sources will be linked in the description if it's something you want to look further into yourself. I always promote people doing their own research and forming their own opinions on topics. I'm just here to help with introducing an inciting conversation. With that all said, let's break the ice with the TikTok coming from one of the activists and popular TikToker, Victoria, or Fat Fat Feminist as she's mainly known as, who pushed to get this bill passed. I just got news that the bill did pass. In New York City, we now have protection for fat people. <laughs> We have protection for the workplace, housing, and public accommodations for people of all weights and heights. The bill passed 44 yes to 5 no. We did it. I'm so happy. There have been so many people working on getting this bill passed. I have been such a small, small part of it, but I'm so grateful to have even played such a minute piece of it. I'm so happy. This bill has made history. I can count on my hands how many places in the country there are protections for fat people. And now New York City is one of them. I am so beyond happy and proud of all the work that everyone has done for this. NAFA, Flair, the council members, there are so many people who have been involved. Fat activists and people just telling their story. I know I haven't shut up about this, but I'm literally so happy. This is such a big deal. Like she said, the bill protects from discrimination towards people due to their weight or height. This isn't just a bill focused on people worried about fat phobia, but also those where they are being discriminated against due to how tall they are. So what does the bill summary state to enact exactly? Summary of legislation, quote, This bill would prohibit discrimination on the basis of a person's height or weight in employment, housing, and public accommodations. This bill would also create an exemption for employers needing to consider height or weight in employment decisions only where required by federal, state, or local laws or regulations or where Commission on Human Rights permits such considerations because of height or weight may prevent a person from performing essential requirements of a job and no alternative is available or this criteria is reasonably necessary for the normal operation of the business. This bill would similarly permit consideration of height or weight by operators or providers of public accommodations. Covered entities under this law would have affirmative defense that their actions based on a person's height or weight were reasonably necessary for formal operations. End quote. This means that an employer can't look at someone who is visibly overweight or obese, very tall or very short, and decide not to hire them based on that alone unless there are specific and proven necessary reasons to do so for the job requirement. As in, if someone needs to be fit enough to do heavy lifting and strenuous work, they can legally deny someone who is not fit whether they be too weak in stature or too heavy to move around efficiently. Of course, this is something that employers may have to test to prove that the person would not be able to be efficient in this job. Similar to the protection of jobs, people looking for housing or accommodations can't be turned away due to weight or height. If there is some inconvenience then, that would have to be dealt with, whether it be fixing a weight restriction or height restrictions. I want to go over some testimonies of people from the court transcripts during the hearings in support of this bill. This testimony comes from Michelle Krauss, who is a senior social worker in the Disability Justice Program on behalf of NY Lawyers. Her statement reads as, quote, I advocate for adults and children with physical and mental disabilities in all different realms of their lives. I am also very knowledgeable about people of short stature and their daily discrimination because I am a person with dwarfism, end quote. She continues with, quote, People of short stature who are not disabled based on appearance are consistently discriminated against by the lack of size ranges or clothing, furniture, vehicles, equipment, stairs, and public conveniences with little to no legal resource. Employment discrimination can be overt, and formal height requirements exist for several jobs. People with short stature are denied or forced out of employment opportunities based on prejudices based on representations and fairy tales and science fiction television. They are not often seen as not having abilities, talent, and value. 
I urge you to pass this local law so New Yorkers with height and weight differences can have equal and fair access to employment opportunities, housing, and public accommodations. Your support of the passage of this law will be instrumental in providing more effortless living for people who are regularly marginalized. End quote. Here, she's referencing people who are short not due to a disability like dwarfism, but just by genetic happenstance. So, the laws for discrimination when it comes to protection of height stop at disability protection, as in, this leaves others who aren't disabled but have a quote unquote marginalized stature unprotected from employer or housing bias and public accommodations. This next testimony comes from Substantia Jones, who's the creator of the Addy Positivity Project. I'm reading from the highlighted parts of the screen. Pause if you want to read all the testimony or reference the links. Joan starts out with a note. Quote, Note, I am fat. I use the term fat, and I encourage you to as well. In some morally neutral descriptor, the word overweight, however, is a term of judgment, suggesting there is an agreed upon size beyond which one mustn't exist. An obese pathologizes a naturally occurring point of the spectrum of benign human size variation. I realize many well-meaning folks use the O word, but nomenclature matters here, and these words are not without consequences. End quote. She continues on to discuss the struggles she faces. Quote, I cannot merely make dinner reservations or purchase tickets to entertainment venues and theaters, as those with culturally normative bodies do. If I want everyone in my group to be accommodated safely and reasonably, I must scour the internet for photos of each location seating, ideally labeled with recent dates. I hunt down sturdy-looking armless chairs or booths with tables not attached to the floor. Despite all this research, during which many restaurants, concerts, and such are stricken with consideration, I must at some point get a box office agent or restaurant reservationist on the phone to ensure the seating is still what I found online, and ask about weight limits and space. Although I've never encountered a rude agent, and each has earnestly wanted to be helpful, they are across the board inadequately trained and reluctant to even speak with me about it, operating under assumption that fat is inherently pejorative, and any discussion of our needs is a hot potato. End quote. Another story of seating issues follows here. Quote, One example is a lecture I booked at a New York University's brand new, state-of-the-art auditorium. They were understandably very proud of it, and when I noted the uniform theater seating, I was shown a section with no seats for those using wheelchairs, but no wider seating nor armless chairs. Believe me when I tell you, everyone involved in booking and planning my lecture was familiar with fat culture and accommodating those with all manner of non-conforming bodies. By any measure, they'd be considered fat-friendly. However, the needs of those at higher weights or wider bodies hadn't occurred to them, it certainly didn't occur to the designer of this otherwise brilliantly appointed new auditorium. On the evening of my lecture, there was a scramble to bring in heavy club chairs and lounge seating from the lobbies and offices throughout the building. Everyone was completely lovely about the heavy lifting, and, I ass and assured me that going forward, they request permanent changes be made. But without laws protecting fat people's access to public accommodations, there's no motivation to consider our needs, to mind our safety, to properly train employees not to use leprosy-based language when a fat person wants a ticket of reservation. And NYC's own city bike program sets aside this example, using bikes with a weight limit of 260 pounds. There are people who exceed that weight limit utilizing city bikes, many of whom don't know this weight limit negates their insurance protections. This is wildly unsafe. The basic tenet of equality is this. As much as possible, everyone should be able to enjoy the same experience, without undue risk or discomfort, without humiliation, last minute scrambling, standing while others are seated, waiting for a member of staff to unbolt a theater seat from the floor and replace it with a straight chair." End quote. This testimony came through email but was presented. It comes from Barbara Bruno, the author of Worth Your Weight, What You Can Do About a Weight Problem, and Health at Every Size, A History. She's also on the advisory board for NAFA, which is the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance and Councils on Size and Weight Discrimination. This is what she wrote in support of the bill. Again, I'm only reading the highlighted portions. Quote, Fat people have suffered from size and weight discrimination for as much of my life as I can remember. And I am 75 years old. I spent my entire youth dieting, finally deciding at age 27 that I no longer wanted to live on diets. 
From no longer supporting diets, I eventually became one of the founders of Health at Every Size movement, which I still support and which I have since brought to Cornell University. I want these intelligent and hardworking students to use their abilities to make the world better, rather than being consumed by trying to fight their own genetic makeup. One of my New York clients was referred to me by his physician. Quote unquote, John was a skilled blue collar worker. He was happily married and had grown children with whom was close to. He was so good at his job that his boss gave him raises, praise, and a new Cadillac to reward him for how well he had worked over many years. He was also a fat man. His company was eventually taken over by a new owner who told John that he had to lose either 100 pounds or his job. John tried everything he could to lose the weight, but couldn't lose 100 pounds. A middle-aged man, he eventually lost his job, and as time went on, he also lost the money that he carefully saved for his retirement. More than a century of weight loss treatments have failed, but have resulted in vast numbers of people with eating disorders, low incomes, fewer jobs, educational and housing opportunities, denial of opportunities to adopt children, discrimination in travel, accommodations, and clothing, biased or denied medical care. Diet programs, drugs, and surgeries have thrived, resulting in people who end up fatter, poorer, agoraphobic, and depressed. Size discrimination is based on the premise that weight is within our control. It's not. Size discrimination is lethal. End quote. And she attached a photo, which is on the screen, but if you're just listening, it's Jones herself with other women protesting in front of the White House with signs saying, Fat freedom and big bodies, not small minds. This next testimony comes from Stacey Evans, quote, 35-year resident of New York City and 45-year resident in a fat body. I navigate this city and my life here with almost constant reminders that my body isn't standard. I've dealt with workplace discrimination based on my size, discrimination in healthcare based on my size, and I thank the council and this community for its focus on this issue. A few months before COVID, I went to see an off-Broadway show. When I got into the theater, one glance told me the narrow-armed middle chairs wouldn't fit my ample butt, and that I'd be so horribly uncomfortable that I wouldn't be able to enjoy the show. I checked in with the usher, asked if there was any wider or armless chairs that could be swapped for mine. When the usher returned with a handyman to figure out my situation, my chair needed to be unbolted from the risers. She then describes her start in advocating for fat acceptance. Quote, it started after I damaged my knee in a car accident and began to realize that venues could and would accommodate me as a disabled person, so why shouldn't I ask for the accommodations I need as a fat person? If I'm Meg Ryan ordering food in When Harry Meets Sally because I know that I want and I can't really imagine why I shouldn't have it, I visited theaters before buying tickets so I could try out the seats and ask about better options. I've called ahead to restaurants and to find out how close together tables are placed so I'll know if I can move easily to and from my seat. I let the staff at the writing residency I attended last year know that I needed an armless, high weight capacity desk chair and a sturdy bed. I know what will make me comfortable, and if it's possible to have that, why wouldn't I? And if it's not possible to have that, well, why not? I deserve to move through the city with ease. Without bruised tips and thighs, I know how I deserve to be treated and I'm comfortable making sure you know too." End quote. This statement comes from Jermaine D. Williams, a public advocate for New York City. Quote, Employers should focus on whether or not the candidate has skills and or experience to do the job. They should not be worried about someone's physical appearance as it continues a vicious cycle of bigotry. It is highly unprofessional and harmful. Too often, employers are missing out on the brilliant individuals due to their bias. We need to do better. I hope my colleagues show their support today." End quote. The final testimony I want to show is in video format from TikTok. It is of Victoria, the fat activist I showed in the beginning, who speaks to the council members about her own experience being fat in New York City. Hi! Sorry. <laughs> my name is Victoria. Thank you for letting me have the opportunity to speak. I just graduated from college in New York this past year, and while I loved my New York experience, I couldn't help but compare it to the experience of my peers. People walking past me with their quick New York stride, hearing the snide comments about how I walk too slow and I take up too much space on the sidewalk. The quick sideways glances as I enter the bus, bags placed on the seat next to them, their biggest fear being touched by fat flesh. Forcing my body through turnstiles at the train station, turning sideways just to barely squeeze through those metal bars. 
having to contact the Center for Disabilities at my school requesting a special accommodation for a desk capable of containing my body. My choice is being sit at the special desk at the back of the class, serving as a reminder to the room that I don't fit or suffer in silence, wood digging into my side, hoping that I remember the lecture because at the angle, there's no way I would get a pen to paper. Something as simple as being able to sit in my seat and take notes like my peers, I did not have the privilege of doing. I had to get accommodations because my school didn't once consider my needs and I was put at a disadvantage. I wasn't the only student that couldn't fit in those seats. I was just one of the few that knew I deserved better and asked for it. I am consistently doing little things every single day to survive in a city that does not take fat people into consideration. I am reminded every day that this world, this city that I love so dearly, is built without my body in mind. And that's what's so insidious about anti-fatness. It's everywhere. Sometimes it's not even malicious, it's just in the little things that you would never even notice if you aren't fat. But for people like me, I live my life taking extra steps, making the necessary accommodations just to survive. Every time I squeeze my body into a chair or turnstile that is clearly made for a different body, a smaller body, I'm reminded that I am not considered. I feel like an intrusion, an inconvenience, like I don't belong here. Passing this bill tells fat people that we aren't alone, we're not unwanted, and having the government behind us make sure that we'll no longer feel as though we're a mere in inconvenient afterthought. Thank you. She discusses a lot about her day-to-day -day problems due to being obese, the accommodations she makes for herself or requests from others. There is an overwhelming sense to Victoria that obese people are being victimized or oppressed by New York City's infrastructure and the people within it. At the end of this hearing, there is an interesting statement made by a council member, quote, You know we support fat acceptance here in this council, and the city accepts it as well. Let's bring it home. Thank you, end quote. Now that we've heard from quite a few people, I wanted to dive a little into white discrimination in the workplace so that we have a better understanding of it. This part of the video is half factual information coming from sources I will have linked and half my interpretation of it. So again, please look into it yourself if you want to explore more. First, I want to show this page from the National Bureau of Economic Research that dives into why obesity lower wages, as in why being obese makes it less likely to get a good job or a high-paying job. What stuck out to me was this, quote, The cash wages for obese workers are lower than those for non-obese workers because the cost to employers of providing health insurance for these workers is higher. Because obesity is associated with increased risk for a range of chronic conditions, healthcare costs are higher for obese than normal weight individuals." End quote. So, it appears that companies not wanting to pay extra for higher insurance rates for those with comorbidities may be part of why an employer would refuse someone who's overweight or obese. This article goes into more specifics about money ranges, percentages, etc. that I don't think is needed in this specific video for discussion, but it will be linked if you're interested in learning more. Like a lot of things in this world, it comes back to money. Corporations would not be allowed to use healthcare costs or reject possible employees if they are protected under disability law. So the same would apply to overweight or obese people. This brings up the question of if disability law should be stretched to cover obese people or if two separate laws are needed. The Committee on Civil and Human Rights hearings for this bill actually brought up this. Here it states, quote, for example, obesity may constitute a covered disability, and disability, just as a reminder, is defined in the human rights law as a physical, medical, mental, or psychological impairment, so it includes a wide variety of identities. Additionally, where a physical characteristic that's part of a religious practice or observance, it would be violation of the human rights law to discriminate against an individual based on that characteristic. For both disability and religion, the human rights law requires employers to provide what we call reasonable accommodations to enable an individual to fulfill the essential functions of their job." End quote. The hurdle for fat acceptance here would be agreeing that obesity is a physical disability. Obesity can lead to disability, but is it something that could be labeled as a disability on its own? When looking for sources discussing solid evidence of weight discrimination, the main study that was referenced in articles was from the Korean Education and Employment Panel, or KEEP for short. Quote, This study extracted data on high school students for four years from the Korean Education and Employment Panel from 2010 to 2013. 
The key independent variable is obesity status. The study determined the independent variable using the individual's BMI, which is calculated by dividing the respondent's self-reported weight in kilograms by the square of the respondent's self-reported height in meters. Overweight and obesity were combined, considering that the World Health Organization Regional Office for the Western Pacific, or the WPRO, and Korea Center for Disease Control and Prevention specified a BMI equal or above 25 as obese for Asians. End quote. The main issue I have with the study being used as a reference for American weight discrimination conversations is that this study was not done in a demographic or culture similar enough to America. The attitude around weight and size in Korea is a lot different than that in America, along with the actual rates of overweight and obese people. I'll make it clear that I'm not a professional in the world of statistics or anything like that, but from what I've read about this study, it does not seem rational to apply it so willingly to American weight discrimination or the culture around weight in general in America specifically. Since this was the main study that kept popping up, I looked further for studies based in America. Again, these articles will be linked in the description. The study here quotes, Back in 2004, a landmark study found that a 65-pound increase in women's weight is associated with a 9% drop in earnings. The authors of the study noted that in terms of wages, the quote-unquote obesity penalty basically amounted to losing three years of experience in the workplace, end quote. Law professor Jennifer Chanel looked into this problem as well. She states in this article, quote, What my research indicates is that obese women are more likely to work in physical activity jobs and less likely to work in personal interaction jobs. Working in sales means being the face of the company and making more money. An obese woman, based on Chanel's research, is more likely than average white women to have the job in a warehouse and less likely to work in sales, end quote. Basically, because being obese or overweight is not the standard of beauty, companies may not want those who aren't found attractive by the majority to be representing their company. It's already known that how physically attractive you are can interfere with your likelihood of being hired. But what's interesting is this applies to mainly just women. This goes past obesity, though. Simply an asymmetrical face, acne, scars, anything that can be perceived as a flaw can reduce the chances of being hired compared to someone without those perceived flaws. This is where the bill adds height into the mixture too, wanting to protect short people from being excluded due to not being the beauty standard. For example, there was the whole issue of the clothing company Hollister only hiring very attractive people who would work at the front of the store, basically shirtless, and those who were less physically appealing had to work in back stock. This issue has also been reported in other stories like Victoria's Secret and Abercrombie as well, and I'm sure a bunch more that I'm missing. Chanel found that this issue of attraction is less common in obese men being hired. An obese man is much more likely to be hired in a public position than an obese woman. So, is the issue of obesity in the process of hiring an issue of general fat phobia if it mainly applies to women, or is it a problem of sexism? If being generally quote-unquote unattractive, to the employer prevents employment? Should the law be covering any perceived flaw and not just obesity and height? There has been criticism of New York City spending time and money on this bill when there are issues that the community views as more pressing and deserving of attention. For example, homelessness. I looked at the financial statement for the bill and it says, quote, it is estimated that there will be no impact on revenues resulting from the enactment of this legislation, end quote. So the bill itself won't cost the taxpayers any money to write in, but taxpayers obviously are paying public servants to be in the courtrooms making these decisions. There's also a worry of small businesses being forced to expand, literally, <laughs> to accommodate morbidly obese people out of fear of being sued. Whether or not this will happen, I can't say and something that will wait to be seen. The bill does state that it protects businesses or public property whose accommodations are reasonable, so whether or not something is reasonable would be decided by the courts. For example, let's say there's a 300 pound weight limit on a public chair in a park, school, business, whatever. If someone is over that weight, sits there and breaks a chair resulting in physical injury, would that person have reasonable grounds to sue? Would 300 pounds be seen as a reasonable cap to put on a chair, 
or would it be seen as not accommodating and not fit for people to use, leaving the owner liable? There is so much gray area in this bill that in the end, we don't know what is and isn't accommodating enough for the general public, which may lead to unreasonable lawsuits that, regardless of fault, waste time and money for every party involved. There is concern that changes may be made to things like turnstiles, public transportation, and many other public features to be made larger or wider if pressed enough by this specific community. This would be using money that the public would rather be put into a cause they find more beneficial or important. Again, I'm not saying this is my personal opinion, I am just going over the questions and concerns I have read from those discussing this issue. I do believe that someone's weight should not be a factor in whether or not they get a receptionist job or a sales job. If someone is qualified and physically capable of doing the work, how they look should not matter. If that employee requires a bigger chair, bigger bathrooms, or even bigger doorways, that's when it gets trickier. Not providing those accommodations could be viewed, legally, as weight discrimination under this bill. Which, again, leaves a lot of gray areas and possible issues for employers from small businesses to large corporations. Because of this, I think the bill relates closely to disability protection laws in the workforce, as in providing room for wheelchairs, wheelchair accessible buildings, housing, bathrooms, doorways, hallways, or whatever else is necessary for someone with a physical disability to work along with their peers. This conversation brings me back to the testimony of one of the fat activists we read from, Stacey Evans, who claims she began advocating for fat accessible spaces slash accommodations when she saw those accommodations were being made after she became disabled due to a knee injury. So, again, should obesity be treated as a disability and protected under a law along with other disabled people, or is it going too far to view a treatable condition the same way the law views someone who is paralyzed or mentally disabled? Should there be a separate bill in place to prevent turning people away from physical attractiveness that includes obesity, height, tattoos, acne, hair color, scars, etc.? Instead, without the requirements of accommodating obesity. Should the public, government, businesses be responsible for accommodating obesity, or are the impacts of being obese solely on the shoulders of the obese person? This was a lot of information to go through and a lot to comprehend. I hope I did okay in presenting this whole bill to you and that you found it at least entertaining. I'm sure we will be seeing bills like this proposed across America as obesity becomes more and more prominent, therefore affecting more people's lives. Let me know your thoughts on this bill, whether you support it or not. I just ask that everyone stays respectful towards each other. Thanks so much for stopping by the ranch. If you found this video informative, then please pet the cow by clicking the like button. And for more videos like this, subscribe. The Discord server and my social media accounts are linked below. I hope everyone has a great week, and I will see you in the next one.